Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Advanced Radionic Workshop Series of the 1994 USPA Conference. This morning, our guest and speaker is Dale Pond, who is a past editor of the Journal of Sympathetic Vibratory Physics, which relates to the works of John Ernst Worrell Keeley. He's a writer, lecturer, and teacher. Presently, he's building a super heat pump, which is based on the technology of Tesla, Keeley, and others. This morning, he will be dealing with sympathetic vibratory physics and the science of harmony and music set in triune combinations, which Keeley used to operate his etheric generators. Dale Pond. Thank you. Good morning. I'm glad you could all come to witness this uh, fantastic week we have here about radionics and vibration theory. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about John Keeley, his history, what he did, what we think he did, the 10 years of research that I've personally put into the subject. And we happen to have a motor here with us today that John Keeley himself made. It's been sitting in a museum for many, many years. And I'll explain to you how that works. This will be the second public demonstration on how this particular motor works in the past 130 years since it was invented. He kept it a secret, but uh, we're going to give it out now. Also, I'm going to talk about the science and physics of sympathetic vibrations. Sympathetic vibration is a well-known topic in engineering, although it's not used very much. It is very well known about. It has been known about for 200 years or longer. John Keeley got into the middle of his vibration research, and he discovered that to really unleash the forces in the universe, we have to work with sympathetic vibrations. And I'll talk to you about those and what they are and why they are. They're very much like resonance, but they're not resonance. Very similar to that. Is there anyone in the audience who hasn't heard of John Keeley, doesn't know what he did? Quite a few. Mr. Keeley was born in 1837 near Philadelphia. <clears throat> As a youngster, he was always interested in sound and music and, and vibration, things of that nature, especially during church when he saw the windows vibrate when, when the choir sang. And he got real curious about what caused that resonance in the windows. And that began his long career. One of the most fantastic scientific researchers in history was this man, John Keeley, and he kind of got buried. He died in 1898, but that brief period from the 1860s, late 1860s to 1890s, he did an incredible amount of research into vibration, molecular and atomic structures. He worked with radioactivity, or radiation rather, not radioactivity as we know it. It was quite a bit different. His was benign, was absolutely harmless, when understood and worked with properly. Um, several times he blew the back end of his laboratory out, so it can be very dangerous. And uh, he was the expert, and he, he kept losing it once in a while. In 1872, some investors came to him. He had built the first prototype of this particular motor in the late 1860s. In 1872, some promoters and businessmen in Philadelphia came to him and said, why don't we form a company, a stock company, and we'll sell stock and we'll get enough money to develop this motor and bring it onto the market. So that began the time of the Keeley Motor Company business, which has a a very colorful history. Over a period of 10 years or so, they managed to develop $6 million of investments into the development of this motor. However, most of that money went to the guys who had the stock, which was these business people, and Keeley never really saw much of it. He only had enough of it to keep building new machines and older machines. This particular motor operates on water and sound. He made 129 versions of this motor. We don't know which model this one is, although we're pretty sure it was one of the later versions. It was very, very refined. The one single patent that Keeley filed that we've been able to locate was filed in 1874 on this motor, but it was a very crude design. And we have copies of that patent. We have a little bookstore over in the other room where we have all of this material we've been able to get our hands on and is available on that subject. Fundamentally, this motor would draw in water, just plain old water, into itself using a vacuum 
and I'll explain the different components to it as we go along. Once the motor got to vibrating and it would start to vibrate on its own, this water would begin to pulsate. And pulsations in a water stream is called water hammer. When you shut off a water stream, you get this water hammer effect. And that is where an etheric vapor is evolved in the process of water hammer. This is technically known today as cavitation. There's four types of cavitation, one of which is called acoustic cavitation, which is what's used in this motor. During the process of a cavitation, or as is sometimes referred to in these circles, implosion is the same thing as cavitation, so you get the imploding of these forces. It's the female force of the ancients. This implosion cavitation is the female force being released in these machines. It has been established in modern engineering. You can find it in any book on cavitation. There's only two books on cavitation ever been written that I've been able to track down, and both of them say the same thing. There are infinite levels of energy being released during the process of cavitation, this imploding. When, the, when the, you got the expanded gaseous vapors, when they collapse, that's the implosion, when they collapse in the cavitation process, there is released infinite levels of energy. And all the scientists who've written on the subject claim the same thing again, that they do not know what's going on. They see this thing, they measure it, they photograph it, they've got all these technical studies on it, but they do not understand what's happened. It's totally foreign to the male-based science that we have going on today. This is the evolution and the opening up of the female force that has been occulted in the old metaphysics and the old mystical circles for centuries and centuries. John Keeley stumbled on it and this was his gallant effort to harness these incredible forces. <clears throat> I believe it was in 1888 or 1889 Keeley decided he was not going to pursue this type of motor development any longer. He figured that the that he, he was not able to capture the etheric force and, and turn it into a motive force, as in a motor, to suit the purposes that they were trying to do. About the same time, a very wealthy lady from Philadelphia, Mrs. Clara Bloomfield Moore, came into Keeley's life in a benefactor way, benefactress, and she told Keeley that if he would stop trying to make a motor, make a commercial enterprise out of this thing, and begin his scientific investigation of this phenomena that he was working with, she would fund his research, pure research. He agreed, and she funded his work for the next 10 years. Pure scientific research. That's why we don't see any more machines in the head than we've got this one and one other one in Vermont. <clears throat> in 1893, Keeley had finished his study of research. He left the etheric vapor side of it and he went into a new side of it which I call negative attractive forces. He built a whole class of machines when he left this machine and went into the negative attractive energies. These are the female forces, these are the high vibration forces in these new machines where he could actually, and he did, he built machines where his mind was keyed to the machine. If he thought a certain symbol or a certain word or whatever, these machines would start or they would stop. Only he could start them and operate them. Later on, he devised methods that anybody could operate these same machines, but it was based on mind energy. Eventually, he came to, to say and to teach us that all force in the universe is mind force, just operating in different realms. All force is mind force. And he tapped into this infinite realm of energy and we'll go on to explain how, how that's all tied together. Um, it'll also explain a great deal about this radionics research where symbolism plays such a big part. And we say, well, this looks like magic and science can't explain it, they can't accept it, but we do have means and methods now that we can tie these things to conventional engineering where it makes sense. And we'll get into that a little bit too. First, I want to explain this motor a little bit so you have some of the history behind what we're dealing with and then we'll go into some of the vibration physics. <clears throat> this little... Is that all right? You were standing on her feet. Okay. This motor 
was given to one of Keeley's lawyers in the late 1800s. We assume it was given to him or it was part payment or whatever. We don't know exactly. A Mr. Housen. <clears throat> Later on, he donated this to the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia. And it sat in the Franklin Institute for 50 years. And they had a little sign on it that said it was a perpetual motion machine. Well, it was not a perpetual motion machine. They called it that because they didn't know what it was or how it worked. Or they didn't have any idea about it. They just call it perpetual motion. And uh, my friend Victor Hansen, who is in the other room, he owns this machine. He bought it from the Franklin Institute for $1,000. Took him eight years to get the money together to pay for it. He eventually got it and took it home. And he had it since the 40s. So he's had it for another 50 years. <clears throat> uh, three or four years ago, <clears throat> I had a chance to look at it for the first time. And uh, if any of your engineers, and you look at this thing, you say, it is absolutely bizarre. There's no way this thing can work. Because in conventional male-oriented physics, where we take, where we put in energy, we've got to hit it with something, you know, this makes no sense because it doesn't operate with that philosophy. It operates with the female forces of implosion. So the thing kind of operates backwards. And when you look at it a little bit and you say, well, this thing operates backwards, and then all of a sudden your mind just gets all clouded and confused because you're not used to thinking in those terms. But after a while, it gets kind of simple. And this is brilliant. If Keeley did anything, he was a brilliant machinist and a brilliant mechanic. He just had a cleverness of making things. Water would come in through this orifice. Uh, once he got the, the thing primed with water in the system, he could just kind of crank, give this thing a little crank, and it would create a vacuum, and the water would draw itself through the machine. Now, one interesting concept is the water formed a part of the mechanism. That's not normal for that. That's not normal engineering. We don't normally do that, where the water is actually part of the motion of the machine. So this thing is kind of like a holistic machine. It's not a machine operating on the water or the water operating on the machine. It's the water and the machine operating together as a whole unit. It's kind of like the human body does. So I give this thing a crank. Water will come into here above this level, this tube, this horizontal tube that goes across the front. The tube goes through this pulsating chamber. I call this a pulsating chamber. And the tubes are hollow. There's nothing inside of them. The same thing with this tube. It's just a straight tube. There are holes in the center so that it has access to the internal volume of this pulsating chamber. This chamber is 1 64th of an inch in thickness. It is red brass. It's very hard, very resonant type brass, whereas this is a yellow brass. It's red brass, kind of like a naval brass. And the interesting thing is, once the water came into this and started through the system, this chamber would begin to pulsate. And because it's mostly got air in it, we would have a pulsation of a high and low pressure forming at intervals, very high in frequency. <clears throat> so this becomes a pump. Once the water is in motion, this pulsating chamber becomes a pump with no moving parts. It's really ingenious. Just a year ago, I ran across a, a NASA paper where these guys, some engineer didn't even have a, his name on the paper, had designed a, a waveguide using a transducer, and he had developed a pump using a transducer there again with no moving parts. So here was a validation from NASA that this concept works. And I thought that was really good that we ran into that paper. In these two mechanisms, one on each side, these are check valves. The water would come across horizontally and start up through this check valve, and all it is a round ball sitting on a round hole. So water could come this way, but it can't go back down. Then the water would come through these pipes around here. The, there's two on each side into these pistons. Now, there's two kinds of pistons. This is kind of an, an enigma why there's two distinct designs on these pistons. They are not the same. And this left side, my, oh, your right side, we have what we consider a standard piston arrangement. Underneath, we have a bar that goes underneath that pushes a piston up into this, into this larger chamber. The water would come into the top of that cylinder on top of that piston. And in the end, there's a valve that goes straight through here. It's a rotary valve 
so it just rotates. In this case, it just rocks back and forth. So the water could come through that cylinder. When the, when the valve got in the right place, the water would shoot through into this cylinder, pushing this crankshaft and causing it to rotate. It was real simple. However, the things that go on while it's doing all that is really neat. The pulsations would drive the water past the check valves into, a, into this cylinder down here, pushing this rod down, which lifted this weight on the far side here. So it would lift this weight on the far side, thereby putting pressure on this water in this cylinder. So here we've got water under tremendous pressure because the injections of the pulsating waves pounding that water the minute the little rocker arm rocked the valve back and forth, we've got a high velocity stream of water coming past the valve. So when you close the valve in high velocity water, what do you get? You get a water hammer. You get that pounding. And water hammer is when you close the faucet in your sink and the pipes bang in your basement. That's water hammer. There's infinite pressure in that. So that pressure, I, I, I did a computer model of what happens in here. Of course, computer model is based on ideal conditions, which this isn't. But I was surprised that it showed within eight cycles, eight cycles of this valve opening and closing, the pressure goes to infinity. Now, that's an ideal situation, which this isn't. <clears throat> so we got the high, high speed stream of water coming through the valve system, pushing this piston up, and it would cause a little bit of rotation. And on the other side, there's two types of water hammer, by the way. There's upstream and downstream. Water coming into a valve, you shut the valve, that water key has a momentum that keeps going against the valve. And the reverberation of this shock wave going back upstream, away from the valve, creates a pocket of negative pressure, low pressure, a vacuum, which will collapse as you impose, causing a pounding. On the downstream side, the water wants to keep going, so it creates another vacuum, which collapses and causes another shock wave. So if we time that shock wave back and forth on either side of the valve, it goes upstream up the pipe and it comes back down. If you open the valve at the same time that reverberation of the shock wave comes back, it will add to the, the original one. It's like a child on a swing. You push a child on a swing. If you push it to the right moment, it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And by the way, that is the same principle that Moray used in his valve assemblies in the 1840s, 18, or 1930s and 40s, where he caused an oscillation of electrical current. It's much like Bearden talks about today with scalar electromagnetics, where they got bifilar coils, and they got this tremendous uh, charge of current, not current, but uh, potential, that they oscillate back and forth. So we've created a potential in here, and we oscillate it back and forth, and the valve lets loose just enough to keep the mechanism going. On the other side, there is a slightly different, well, it's, it's fundamentally different <clears throat> thing happening. Because this piston down here does not capture water. It is a round ball sitting in a round hole. So when the water squirts through here, it hits on top of this ball and then goes immediately all over the place. But while it does that, it creates a vaporized situation on top of that sphere, and it polarizes the water. Right above the round portion, we have a little chamber in here. It's a little square chamber, and that bothered me for two years, what this chamber was all about, because it's a rectangular hole going through this little chamber. That when the ball closes, it closes one end of it, and when the valve closes, the other end of it's closed. And I got to thinking about waveguides and whatnot. This thing is a waveguide. When both the valve and the piston are open, we have a certain fundamental frequency. When one or the other closes, the frequency goes up nearly four times. And I think that's in my paper. When that happens, based on the dimensions of this waveguide, we have microwave frequencies in operation on this water vapor. Microwave frequencies from a mechanical mechanism is absolutely incredible. So we get this water vapor in here and we microwave. What happens when we microwave water? So we get a high potential expansion rate of the water going through this valve and driving this piston. So we've got two different drive mechanisms working on this little motor. So we, the guy was a genius. 
There's no doubt about it. And this was a machine he gave up on. He went on to better and more higher things that we're only now beginning to get any kind of idea about. Any questions on this motor or the water phenomenon or the cavitation, the water hammer? Can you fire it up? No, it's not operational. We, uh, it was about two years ago when I finally hit on the idea that it was water hammer. We did uh, change some of the pipes because they were all split and broken and some of the joints were broken. We soldered those up and we put new gaskets in it. Um, and we put it in a bathtub and we ran a little bit of water into it. And it was kind of phenomenal what happened. The thing like it came alive. It just kind of, it like it came alive. And uh, But it didn't operate as we think it should operate. And we feel that's because of the timing mechanism in these valves. We don't understand those yet. So we really didn't know how to deal with those. And first and foremost is this is an original priceless antique. We didn't want to mess with it very much. Just enough to see if my idea was correct about the water hammer, which we did prove and verify. So eventually, if we ever get to any money, we're going to exactly duplicate this thing, and then we can play with that model all we want to. Uh, yeah, you had a question? Raise your hand if you have a question so I can get it on mic. All right, let's go ahead. What would it cost to uh, produce one of those machines? Um, I think machinist time is about between 30 and $60 an hour. <clears throat> it would take a lot of money. It would take several thousands of dollars, just machine work, to duplicate it. Now, another idea is once we know the principles and how this thing works, we can design our own from scratch using electronic valves so we get rid of the friction phenomena and all that kind of stuff. And uh, and I think we do understand it enough to design our own from scratch. And I do have some designs that I've worked with. Uh, uh, I've got a various devices that I've been working on the designs of that we may be able to build. <clears throat> Yes, sir. Have you heard of the 300 mile submar 300 mile an hour submarine? A gentleman, I believe, it was in the 50s, built one as a one man submarine. He crossed the Atlantic Ocean in about uh, oh 24 hours, something like that. And, and but I think he was using a turbine. But a turbine could be used could be set up to use the cavitation principle. Mm -hmm. uh, each blade of the turbine would be uh, making a cavitation. Okay. That's a very good question. No, I haven't heard of that particular machine or that event. Um, using turbines is very uh, interesting because the Tesla turbine, for instance, where you have the smooth disk, I have a model of it over on the, on the workbench over there, on the book table. Um, when it draws water in, if the velocity of that draw exceeds a certain point, the water cavitates. You know, and you, and it will cease to draw. Any pump will do that, can create that phenomenon. Um, so you can only draw water and it's at a certain given velocity. However, I believe the same thing happens with air in jet engines. They can cavitate and they'll flame out and all that kind of stuff. But any fluid will do that. Um, so certain designs like the Schauberger material seem to indicate that we can supersede, we can increase that ability or we can push back that threshold of cavitation to a great extent and thereby increase velocities and, and, and attain those things that you're referring to. I believe Keeley was doing some of that work too. Although there is another way of, uh, of uh, how do you call it, propelling, propelling a craft or a mechanism that is not male-oriented. And we can get into that too. Remind me of that and we'll cross into that. You have a question? Yeah, I'll be, uh, the uh, opposing counterweights is it does it what what do they do is it perhaps that one motor goes for a while and then the other side goes where those counterweights come up and down that's part of the questions we haven't answered in this particular design we know that this weight maintains a pressure against this piston it this is what maintains the pressure within this cylinder so that when this valve opens it has that velocity to the water stream this one over here maintains this piston closed. So when the water ejects against it, there's a certain resistance to the water stream. 
And I thought, well, why couldn't we use spring, spring-loaded mechanism instead of these weights? And uh, there is a different reaction to these weights coming down as opposed to a spring mechanism. And also in the 1880s, they didn't have the materials we got today, so he probably couldn't build a good spring like we can today. So there's, there's many different questions. We don't have them all answered. You know, we've got the basic phenomena figured out, but why did he do this and do that and not the other thing? We can only conjecture. And the, the timing, each cylinder has its own timing and how they work plus the timing in the timing gears. The spring, the acceleration from a spring is totally different from the acceleration of a released weight. So you wouldn't get an instantaneous switch mm -hmm. or as rapid a switch. It would be a more gradual switch. So a spring uh, would have a totally different mechanical phenomenology. And if you're opening and closing a valve, that's probably the, the, the best way. Yeah, I agree with that. That's kind of what I came up with. I had built a model of this cylinder, and I used a spring because I didn't want to build all this mechanical stuff, just to prove that I could capture pressure with water hammer, and it did do that. So we can do those things. And I think if we had more engineering expertise working on this problem, we'd come up with all kinds of solutions to it. Uh, yeah, Dale, you said that you, you'd only find two books on cavitation. Right. Um, do, do you think the level of knowledge in physics uh, right now is sufficient for you to be able to model the uh, cavitation effect of this machine, say? Yeah. For example, I, you, think, you think that the theoretical de de uh, development in physics, the level is high enough right now. Do we, all the concepts that we need to involve here present in physics sufficiently that we might be able to mathematically model this machine? Easily. You think so? Easily, yeah. This, what goes on in here, once you start to, to model it, is real simple. It is, it is echoes of shock waves and things like that. We know a yeah, lot about shock know waves. A lot about shock waves, yeah. And water hammer is a study of these shock waves within a given uh, mechanism, you know, water pipes. So that's where the breakdown occurs is when you try and take the mathematical formula for water hammer and apply it to this engine, well, it, it starts breaking down because those are designed for for water tubing and piping and whatnot, and this isn't. So we've got to modify them to a certain degree to bring them into coincidence with what goes on here. But I do not think that what is happening here is is beyond our current technology. Now, this negative attraction stuff is beyond our current technology. Negative attraction. Could you explain that a little more to negative attraction? Um, well, we'll give, i got to give you some basics first. We'll go through some basics. We can leave this for now. We can come back to it. Anybody got any questions, we can come back to it. We're going to do some other things. The universe is a musical construct. Everything in the universe vibrates. Everything. There is nothing that does not vibrate. So we can almost say that there is nothing in the universe except vibration. Centralized and decentralized vibration or polarized and depolarized vibration. That's what causes particles to come together and to go apart. <clears throat> and we're going to go right into all these details of how this is done according to Keeley's philosophy, which we find out is not that much divergent from modern philosophy. This guy did all this work over 100 years ago. The electron, by the way, was officially recognized in 1893. I think it was Rutherford who got the credit for that. All of this that I'm going to show you now precedes that by at least 10 years and sometimes 20 years. First thing I want to tell you, show you, is what is a vibration? We talk about vibration, we, we teach about it, and yet I'm not sure we really understand what it is. <clears throat> this is a conventional description of a sine wave. It is what we generally consider in standard engineering what a vibration is. Where we have, we've got a a positive phase to a vibration and a negative phase to a vibration, and in the center we've got a neutral phase of these vibrations. Now, in my study and working with Keeley for over 10 years trying to understand what they were doing, this is a graphic representation of measurements. It is not a vibration. It is a graphic representation of changing amplitudes. If we have a point source over here for sound and the sound's traveling in this direction, and we've got a microphone at any position in here, 
the rarefactions and condensations of the, of the air waves as the sound goes through the air. That's what sound is. It's a rarefaction and compression wave. This is what compresses the particles together of the air, and this is what is when it, we have a rarefaction. Okay? So as it passes the microphone, we get an up and down measurement. The meter goes up and down, up and down, but it doesn't really tell us anything. Okay, so what's happening is we've got an expansion and a contraction. The expanding radiating force, that's what the ancients called a male force. It goes out, it radiates out, it impacts things. It's like the sledgehammer approach we use in physics today. You've got to put all this energy into a system to get anything back. And that's only a third of the story. Another third of the story, or almost a whole half of it, is the female side of this vibration. That's this side down here. This is the rarefaction. This is the, is the, once it expands out, then you get the collapse. The collapse is that female force. What is it that causes this collapse? Here's the whole field of science. Modern science is ignoring. They don't even acknowledge it. They're just beginning to, they're beginning to suspect that there's something there. Just like, Women's liberation is just now beginning to happen. We're just now beginning to recognize that women exist. It's really strange. But the parallels in uh, philosophy and science and life, they are absolute. They, that's the way it works. Negative attraction. So here we go. we got radiating propulsive force going outwards. we got an attracting force that comes to the center. So it's a positive propulsive going out, it's a negative attraction coming in. So the negative attraction is the female force. And that's the basic principle behind that and what it is. So we got the night side forces, that's a negative attractive. The ancients talked, Casey talked about that quite a bit, the night side forces. The Atlanteans, the stories go about the Navaz energy, that's a night side force, the dark side forces. But they aren't evil in any way, shape, or form. And because one's positive and the other's negative is, is not one's good or bad. It's just two polarities. It's like a coin. You can't have a coin with one side. It's got to have two sides or there's nothing there. So it's the other side of the duality of mankind. Mankind is a neutral characterization of a duality, male and female. Okay. So we got the forces. In fact, I had a chance to talk to a nuclear scientist. He, he was a retired army. He's, he died a few years ago. But he used to design nuclear weapons. And we got to talking about it. And he said, you know, it's not the explosion of this bomb that's destructive. It is the implosion after that explosion has taken place. That implosion to the center of zero point is, is what causes all the destruction. The negative force is where all the force is that we really need to deal with. It is a gentle force, it is a nurturing force, it is a subtle force. Excuse me, but this is really the yin and yang of family. Yin and yang, that's exactly right. You take those two spheres, you put them together, and you put them together. That's right. In fact, I've got a really neat design here that shows these. these dynamic forces. In this chart, I kind of did a little playing around with it, but over here we can see the three particles within a... Within, this, by the way, let's start in the beginning. We're going to get you lost. This is a simple molecule in Keeley's morphology, his molecular morphology. This large thing is what he called a simple molecule. It's not a complex molecule like a plastic molecule. It's just a simple molecule within which are three what he called inner molecules. That's what these three in the center are. Every particle, he said, had the same configuration. It's the internal constructs which are different. Inside each of these is another three, and inside that another three, on down to infinity. And this is the root of this science. This in another chart. This uh, drawing was originally published in 1886 by John Keeley. <clears throat> uh, this is modified. I just redrew, redrew this to have this transparency. But we can see 
that we've got the molecule, the inner molecule, the atom, the inner atom, on down to eight levels. Keeley built machinery to investigate these eight levels of material substance. And in these eight levels, he got to the eighth level, and he says, I can't build machinery fine enough to investigate the ninth level. So he referred to the ninth levels as the infinite ninths. They, were, they went infinitely beyond his capability of investigating them. Now, correspondence with today's science, I can show you that. This is a revelation. These are my two best charts. And these are fundamental to understanding this science. We're going right to the, to the heart of this one real quick. What we have, here's the molecular level, the largest circle, the intermolecular atomic, etheric, interetheric, all the way to the infinite ninth. Now this is Keeley's development right here. The ancients called it earth, water, air, fire, ether, mind, and God was the infinite ninth. And in modern science, solid, liquid, gases, plasma, photonic, quarkian, and from there it's the guess as to how they put all this thing together. But we know Modern quantum mechanics says there's three quarks and a photon, and there's three photons in an electron. That's modern quantum physics, guys. And we got the same chart that Keeley had over 100 years ago. Now, what this means is the larger the item, and this is basic acoustics, for those of you who know anything about sound, the larger the item, the longer the wavelength, the lower the frequency. So the higher we go up these levels, we get shorter and shorter wavelengths, and we get higher and higher energy states. Keeley maintained 30 years before Einstein that the faster something moved, the more compact it got, and the more compact it got, the more energy it contained. When Einstein hit the scene, he plagiarized all these things, and he wrote it like this. That's what he said. Energy equals mass times speed of light squared. But he stopped at the, at the electronic level. If you go into the quantum level, which he hadn't gone into, this doesn't necessarily apply in this particular way that it's phrased. But what this says, the faster something goes, the higher the energy content. That's what it says. So you get down here, the faster something goes, the greater the energy content. So these smaller subatomic elementary particles have greater energy content than the grosser, more mundane, more material items such as molecular matter. So here's we're, we're, we're slowly approaching to a definition of this negative attractive energy and these subtle energies that are used in radionics is where we're trying to get to. So having established that premise, and please interrupt me with questions. Anybody got any questions? Please just jump right in because we may cover a lot of stuff too quick. Beg your pardon? Charts and photographs They are available? I'm asking you. Uh, yes, they are. I have some books on it on at the book table. I also have a computer program. I spent 10 years putting this computer program together. It's got 11 megabytes of this information in it <clears throat> and all related types of information. It's a vast, vast field, and I don't think any one man could ever master it. So we say, how does all these things connect together? And I'll show you that. It's really simple. If we have two items down here that are seemingly unrelated one to another, you know, me and a guy over in Africa, we're un basically unrelated to each other, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> or a stone here and a stone in, on a Rocky Mountains, it doesn't matter. These are harmonic progressions, what general engineering considers as harmonic progressions, whatever the frequency of this object is, if you double that, you get the harmonic progression or the harmonic series of this object. Okay, engineering uses that every day. It's a real simple concept. Music uses it every day. Um, we can take something over here and we say it's fundamental. is a little bit different. So we don't really see any correspondences in these numbers. However, basic arithmetic, as is found in music theory, and I want to stress this, it is a musical universe. 
because everything vibrates and vibrations are controlled or maintained by number, whole numbers, and how they interact with each other. Pythagoras had it answered 2,000 years ago and he kind of got swept to the side because we had, or we have still today, a partial philosophy. We don't have a holistic viewpoint of nature. Those old philosophers studied many, many, many fields of subjects, especially music and astronomy and arithmetic, and they could see the correspondences between all these fields. Well, somehow we've gotten into a place now where we study one field and we pick that thing apart and we don't really know anything about any other fields. We've become specialists and that has led us down some really bad paths. What we're trying to do here is show you how it can be all tied together very simply to the underlying principles that connect it all together. In music, it is maintained, and there's some music experts in here, and I'm not a music expert. I'm just learning like everybody else. If we take the aliquot parts of a given frequency, those are the numbers that add up to create a given number, like it's factoring. You use factoring in algebra to come up with the aliquot parts of a given number. Two is an aliquot part of 6, 12, 24, 48. So here we can see a connecting link between these numbers right now, right here. Two will go into these. So we have a partial harmony or concordance established between these two separate, seemingly separated objects. Another thing that happens in, in music is called modulation. It's not very well understood by most lay people, but it's a real simple thing. <clears throat> if we frequencies will add together and they will subtract. It's called additive and subtractive synthesis. We can take any of these numbers and add them together. This is what happens naturally in, in sound and vibration. So we can take four and, and uh, eight and we got 12 and look what happens. We get a correspondence over here directly with this seemingly separated, isolated object. I had a gentleman come to me a couple years ago and he says, we want to have, we would like you to design a radionics machine that is operator independent on these high levels of the etheric sciences that Keeley had been dealing in. And I says, it can't be done. No machine can ever be isolated from its operator. And this shows why. And we're going to go here a little bit further and show you why. Now these progressions of numbers can go up in frequency. This is going up in frequency but they can also go down. So you got the exact same thing going down, only we get it into the fractions, and this goes to inf infinity too. So what we just got done saying over here, on this chart right here, is the higher the frequency, the greater the energy content. Another phenomenon in sound, a basic rule of thumb is the higher the density of the media of propagation, the greater the velocity of propagation. That's a standard rule of thumb. If we go up here to an infinitely high level, we've got particles that have infinitely high energy content and they've got infinitely small dimensions. Therefore, that realm has an infinitely high density. So the propagation of a wave through that media is going to be an infinite velocity. I mean, it's just common sense. So what happens when you cause, when you pull a vacuum? How do you isolate this thing called negative attraction? If you pull a vacuum, what are you doing? You're, you're pulling out the molecules, you're pulling out the atoms, the isotopes, and you're creating this space that does not have these larger, slower particles in it. But it's still got these really high, infinitely small particles in it. You can prove that just by looking at a vacuum chamber. You can see through it, which means it's got photons in it. You can broadcast radio waves through it, so it's got electrons in it. And if it's got those in it, it's got the smaller particles. When you get into these higher realms, let's, let's assume that you could pull a vacuum of 100 PSI, which modern science can't do. Keeley claimed to have done it over and over and over again. What you have left in that chamber would be synonymous with this negative attractive energy because it wants to collapse itself. And what is in there? What we just say was in there is infinite energy in there. That's what's in here. And this shows how they're all connected together on infinitely high levels. So this is the basis of how radionics machines operate. We can tune knobs. If you do the potentiometer thing, you're just tuning a certain 
potential in these instruments. You're setting up certain waveforms and frequencies. But you say, well, how does that propagate through the atmosphere? Well, it doesn't propagate through the atmosphere. It goes up this ladder and the high harmonics propagate through the atmosphere. Actually, it's through, it's in between the atmosphere. It doesn't go through the atmosphere at all. <clears throat> so it goes across to the target that has the same chord of frequencies. I think uh, Sherry Edwards called it signature. That's a modern term for it, signature of vibrations. <coughs> Keeley referred to it as chords of mass. So if you've got any given object, uh, if we go back to this one chart, We can see that there's three major particles in here, and then there's three in each of those, in each of those, each of those. So therefore, an atom, a molecule such as this has a fundamental tone, which is the frequency of this larger particle, generally speaking. But it has all these other frequencies in it too. And I think if we count to the eighth level, there's over a thousand particles in this thing. So there's a thousand different frequencies times three again. So it just goes on to infinity. So each object, material object, has a, a whole plenum of frequencies of which we need to identify the fundamental keynote tone. And uh, musicians understand keynotes and fundamental tones. Those are the tones at which a given object will vibrate or resonate. Um, music is a whole side. We could talk for a week on music. <clears throat> Now, I want to show you, in the ancient literature, they talk about materiality as an illusion. I'll show you where they came up with that. And it indeed is an illusion. These particles rotate on planes 90 degrees to each other. So this particle would go in a big circle like this. This one would go in a circle like that. And that one would go in an orbit like that. Three planes of orbit, just like you see in, in uh, modern physics. you got the three planes like that. <clears throat> so they spin at each other around each other. This is not a shell. Even though Keeley maintained there was a shell about this, the shell is a construct. There is no thing here. This line only defines the range of motion of these particles. So they'll rotate about each other, but they won't exceed this range. So it's like a bicycle wheel. If you spin it real fast, you can't really shove a stick through it. If you spun it at an infinite velocity, which this almost is, you couldn't shoot a bullet through it or hit it in an atom smash or anything else. You're not going to penetrate this range of motion. So there really is nothing here. The same thing with these particles here. These things rotating inside this thing, this is just a range of motion. There's no object here. There's no hard shell here. On down into the infinite level. So when you get all done, it's like peeling an onion. There's nothing there. There is no thing there. So that's where the ancients got that thing about it's all energy. There's no material is an illusion, because it is. Now, another thing Keeley dealt with is kind of extraordinary, and we're just now beginning to get the idea that maybe we can do this, too. All the frequencies of this molecule are in harmony with each other. That's like what we got done drawing here. If they're all in harmony with each other, they will tend to stay together. The molecule will hold itself together. That's the negative attractive force holding itself together. That's harmony. The minute you introduce an inharmonic tone, a tone that is different from the concord that's established there, this thing will start to agitate. It's like if you've got a group of people that get along really well together and then somebody comes in and they just start agitating everybody. The, the, the team goes, the team players go, the whole thing starts coming apart. Same thing. In an orchestra, if everybody's playing in tune, we'll make beautiful music. But you get a guy in there starting to shriek on his oboe or whatever, and the place falls apart. Same thing happens with a molecule. If we took an inharmonic tone and introduced it into the structure, it'll just come apart. We don't have to hit it with a sledgehammer. It'll just come apart. And that's how Keeley was able to investigate eight levels, which we can't do today. We're trying to use atom smashers to cost umpteen billions of dollars, and we're not really doing anything. We're not, we're not making it. Any questions on this thing so far?
Um, by the way, the, the, the black areas are considered the negative side, the, the female side, the black areas. The white areas are the male force. They're positive charged. The black side is negative charged. The gray areas are neutral. Oh, I just like to comment that this this has the characteristics of a fractal, you know. Oh yes. Definitely. I don't know if you recognize that or not. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so perhaps it can it can be approached with the mathematical fractals to some degree because uh, that's exactly what a fractal is. That no matter how deep deeper level you go to, the patterns just keep repeating themselves mm -hmm. over and over mm -hmm. again, and it, and so the, the, as the size reduces, the energy goes up. So that's sort of like a reverse fractal in the opposite mm -hmm. direction, yeah. That's exactly right. So that's, that's one of the basic principles of music, by the way, is how the entire construct, that's like these numbers right here, no matter where you go on this scale, the same thing applies in the same way. So these are the natural fundamental principles through which the universe operates. And once we understand those, like this fractal business, then we'll will come in fact let me say that right now before we get too far and I'll get right to you the, <clears throat> the fractal mechanism this is this is the basic fractal mechanism the mathematical construct of a fractal a fractal is a mathematical thing okay what we see in the pretty pictures on fractals is what the computer can generate from those numbers well, this is what generates the numbers. If we have a given input comes in here, we work a change on that input, and it comes out over here. But it's a modified in some way by this modifier, and that's all a fractal is. So we can get in here and we can make a as complicated or whatever we want it to be, and do the same thing with a modifier, and we just keep going back through that modifier over and over and over and over again and we get those beautiful patterns. Music does the same thing because we always work with A, B, C, D, E, F, G. No matter what the octave, we can start at the lowest possible octave and we can go up to the highest possible octaves like in light, 46 or 48 frequency uh, octave, and do that because it's all the same stuff. There is no difference. This, by the way, is the neutral, corresponds to the neutral in these charts where you see the gray. Um, we can get into that too. Yes. I'm not exactly sure how the, these thoughts are coming. I'm really involved in researching health and the physical body, and I can see where vibrations of negative thoughts, stress, uh, chemically induced negative vibrations could start the spin on the molecule in the body and create the, the inharmonic vibrations which result in disease. And that would explain why music therapy and why even singing or doing things for yourself to tune the body, they talk about tuning mm -hmm. and balancing, that would override that program to put it back into a state of harmonic so that they would start flowing and vibrating together in a harmonic state. Is that basically what... That's exactly right. That's exactly right. What... Where we go into the infinite nights, or, or the, the eighth level of these particles, is mind energy. Those are the particles associated with mind. Now, Keeley's work, and I have these beautiful drawings and charts that Keeley left us. I have them over at my table. Anybody's welcome to come by and look at them. He left us these incredible charts of the human brain. Now, the brain is the physical mechanism, the physical substance between our ears. The mind is something else. The brain he considered as an acoustic resonator. The convolutions of the brain determine the various frequencies of the physical brain. Sound, in the ancient literature, sound was what caused the universe to be. Sound is a rarefaction compression of whatever particle media we're dealing with. If it's the etheric realm, and it's those etheric particles. If it's the molecular realm, it's like water. We see the water waves, same difference. Mind is a range of particles on the eighth level of this thing, so every particle in the universe is composed of mind particles. That's why telepathy works, that's why telekinesis works, because we can communicate, we can become in sympathy with those particles of that spoon or whatever it is we're bending or working with, 
and it will do our bidding. In that regard, we are the image of God because we are in touch with this level of energy because that's what we are. So when we meditate and we get real quiet and we cease to cause inharmonic disturbances within our organism, then the purity of that stream of energy can expand and express itself in a more pure form. So, yes, you're right. But this shows, Keeley's work shows how those things are connected one to the other. Now, what I needed to, to say again, and I, and I kind of left this off, what we're talking about is the, the physics of sympathetic vibration. <clears throat> In high school physics, they teach if you have a tuning fork of one frequency over here, and you got the tuning fork over here, the same tone, you vibrate this one, this one responds. That is done via sympathetic vibrations. Sympathetic vibration is a vibration that is sympathetic to both organisms, to both bodies. That's what a sympathetic vibration is. So this vibration in here and this one here would both be sympathetic streams of vibrations between these two objects. So everything is connected with or by sympathy, a sympathetic vibration. Way back when I began this study, a lady came to me. I was working at the Casey Foundation in Virginia. And this lady came to me and she says, well, how does Christ fit into this physics? And I didn't know. That was quite a question. I just didn't know. And I began digging into the Casey material because he talked a lot about Christ and the energies and the patterns and how all that stuff related to each other. And after a while, it finally dawned on me how Christ fits into this and what Christ is in regards to a physical universe. And that is, he was the, symp the sympathy. He was the love. You know, Casey said he lived the law, he was the law, he, he personified the law, he taught the law. And I said, what law? You know, I had to dig that out. That was in the book of John. And the book of John explains how Christ was material and then he became spirit with one with the Father and then one with us and then one with the Spirit. I think it's John 16, something like that. But that was a perfect description of what I just told you a little while ago about how the material realm, the molecular realm, can become the high spiritual realm, the mind levels and beyond, and how it can become the molecular again. Does that... Any more questions on that? Yes. Yeah, this is not really our question. It's... Uh just a little statement uh, when you talk about sympathetic vibrations really what you're talking about is re resonance no. No. no there's a difference between sympath sympathetic vibration and resonance resonance is an effect sympathetic vibration is the cause of that effect if we've got this thing vibrating over here and it has a vibration it is emitting a vibration that happens to be sympathetic to this one over here this one will begin to resonate after the sympathetic vibration impacts it. So resonance is an effect. It's not a cause of it. But it in itself can then become a cause of something else. See? It's all big change. Everything's hooked together. Okay, so, okay. Because, yeah, this is something I've worked on or pondered on my own for a long time. And uh, if you look at all the science, a lot of the effects of science are really caused by, you know, when you're talking about chemistry and how things relate, it's really the vibrations that make all these combinations and molecules possible and uh, I've been working on this trying to put together some kind of paper and it's really an unknown law or principle that's never been published in the books which is that sympathetic vibrations and for some reason I don't know why it's never in there but it's so obvious that's but it's a, it's really a principle but it's not mentioned it's not a law like some of these other laws are and maybe I can talk to you more about that you know the reason why it's left out, it's something really obvious. I call it resonance, but I understand. I, I call, my, my, when I say resonance, I mean both what you're saying, mm -hmm. the, the two things. Well, in, these, in, these, in the realm that we're trying to investigate here, and I need to go back and reiterate, my original investigation personally, my personal quest began in my effort to understand. I was living in South America. I was having a hard time with life in general. And I wanted to understand it to an extent that I wasn't 
a victim of it. You know, I wanted to know more about life and how to deal with it. And as I began studying about cycles, that everything in life operates on cycles, business cycles and whatnot, I began to realize that there's more to this than any of us ever thought. And it's a quest for truth, and it's very difficult to lump things together or to look at something with not as great a precision as we can. We have to look with as great a precision as we can possibly have. So there is a difference between sympathetic vibration and resonance. And we need to understand those differences, or, or we're just lumping things together and we don't have a clear and accurate viewpoint of what we're trying to do or accomplish. And it's, it's, it took me a long time to be able to say what I just told you very simply, you know, the difference between those two things. Yeah. Things like induction and electrical science. You know, the cause of induction is sympathetic vibration, but they don't look at it like that. If you go to the mechanical engineering books, they talk about sympathetic vibration. The... Um, Music talks about it. There's sympathetic instruments. They've been designed for the past 200 years. There's all kinds of things. But they're kind of, it hasn't been a big deal. See? And only through the Keeley stuff had, did he really take that thing. And there is a law of sympathetic vibration. I have that on my table in there. Okay. Have and you tried to take that? That law seems like a fundamental fact of nature. Have you tried to break it down even further, like they, you know, break it down the molecule into, you know, small? Have you tried to look into the more origins of that, or is that something outside this physical plane that's um, just a law? <clears throat> no, there are what, what I call universal principles. And Casey talked about these quite a bit. Keeley dealt with them. All the old philosophers taught about universal principles and laws. Today we don't. Today we, we learn a technology, and that's what we earn our living with. In the old days, these universal principles applied universally, where they weren't universal principles, they were something else. And there are a given set of these principles that we've identified. Polarity is one, resonance is another, rhythm. These are basic fundamental things, and they apply to all realms, whether it's the molecular realm or an etheric realm, they all apply the same. There will be mode shifts and things of that nature, but it's basically the same stuff. So you only got to learn one thing. And it applies to everything. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's there if we care to put forth the effort. Okay, thank you. Do you I'd like to do allow me a little bit to go to the chart and explain practical use of those numbers. Uh, if it's not more in a minute, if it's not more in a minute. I will try as fast as possible. Uh, everyone from time to time goes to for a symphony concert with a famous piano player like Claiborne and so on. There is only one note which is in tune, orchestra with the piano. People don't realize this. And this is uh, how, uh, how this is. Now, ex to explain this one here, if you, uh, uh, let's say this is a um, contra C, I mean the second C on the piano on the left side. Once you play this note, all those other numbers are playing at the same time. People, generally people don't hear it because they are not in train. I'm, I quit uh, to play with the symphony orchestra. I'm still connected with music as a piano, uh, piano tuner. If I play this one here and play, this means uh, contra C. This is octave. The next C flips G, uh, this is seventh, this is two octaves, and so on and so on. Now, if you play this note and you, p you press those uh, equivalent notes, but not playing, just press the keys down, and you play this one here loud, you can hear the whole, all the, all the other so sounds on the piano. It's very easy to demonstrate. This is true of what you, you, are, you, you are talking about. Uh, all other instruments, they are built completely different from piano. Up to uh, John Sebastian Bach, on a piano you could play only in three keys. Let's say C, F, one sharp, and one, one flat, F. Uh, John Sebastian Bach was not hard. He likes to compose in all the keys. So they, they call all the piano tuners and uh, they discuss, and this is a uh, time where they uh, introduce so-called temperament tuning, which is not exactly 
corresponding with, with this side here. We have to compromise to uh, how does, in, in, in other words, I will explain how to understand. For instance, if the violin plays C, uh, uh, half a tone has nine commas. In Europe, we call commas. I don't know what this equivalent in USA. Also commas? Mm -hmm. Okay, nine commas. If we play, a violin plays C, C sharp, he is using five commas. In other words, from C sharp to D remains only four. But if he goes down, he plays D, D flat, he is again using five. From D flat to C remains only four. You see where the conflict is. <laughs> this is what all choirs are doing uh, without instrument. Choirs are doing this. All symphonies or, uh, orchestras are doing this. Even uh, brass instruments are doing this. Now, to, uh, to, to <laughs> yeah, okay, to, to compromise, to use the piano with the orchestra, we are using completely different uh, system of tuning the piano. <laughs> we call it temperament. And I said at the beginning, there's only one note which corresponds correctly with the symphony orchestra, the A. The violin player the violin plays the A, and all people are, uh, plays the A on the piano, and all are playing. All other notes are out of tune. Of course, the general public don't hear it because it's so fine, so close. If I go for, let's say, for Clyburn uh, Symphony Orchestra concert with the, pia with the piano, <laughs> I have to do this because it interferes with my listening. It's, it's not in tune, but this is the only way to do it. Okay. Thank you. Well, he made some very good points there that probably went over with most people's heads. One thing he said there towards the end, that <clears throat> there is discord and harmony. And there is discord innate, naturally found within harmony. We can play these tones in an orchestra. We've got a molecule that's sitting there. This thing is moving. <clears throat> it is spinning and it is oscillating and it is vibrating. It's doing all these things. And motion is caused by discord. And this is a little thing that a lot of these New Age people don't yet realize. When things are in balance, there's no motion. When you bring everything into balance, everything into harmony, there is no motion. That's why when you meditate, you find that still center, you become very, very harmonized, very, very balanced. There is no motion. When you introduce the inharmonic, the male force, bam, you got energy, you got motion, you got activity. So inherent in number. Pythagoras said there was only really one number, and that was one. Everything else were derivatives of that, and they are subsets. So one, in one, we have harmony, pure harmony. But because of its natural propensity to mirror itself to, into its duality, then it breaks out into these other numbers and whatnot, and we get the inharmonic effect from harmony. And he mentioned how commas would go up and they come down in different quantities and whatnot. There is a little thing in there called uh, the Pythagorean comma, which is 81 over 80 parts. And that is inherent in this harmony, because as we go up the scale and we try and come back down, it's not quite the same. There's always this change, one part in 81. So what all those things really mean, we, you know, we've only got so much mind energy to decipher all these things out, but they do play a part. Here's that little tiny piece, and when it comes back down, it gives a little bit nudge not to be the same thing. So life eternally progresses. If they went up and it came back down in the same range, and this is just basic physics, I mean, if everything went up in a higher frequency and came back down the same way they went up, life would be harmonized and there would be no life because life is motion, life is activity, life is doing things. Yes, Bob? Another example of that is the lambdoma that Barbara Hero uh, has reconstructed from the Pythagorean theorems, and uh, she'll be here uh, later to talking about that. Okay. We're going to diverge here just a little bit, give a little bit more basic things about vibration. These, all these basic things I'm giving you are useful. I don't, it hardly matters what field you work in. These things aren't useful. If nothing else, they, t they show you and indicate to you that things aren't as simple as, as they are made out to be sometimes. <clears throat> Every vibration is a complex wave form. There's no such thing as a simple sine wave.
a sine wave is composed of a series of synthesized tones in a harmonic uh, gradient to each other. So if you synthesize a bunch of sounds together, they will add together and create a sine wave like I showed you in the beginning. If we change those aliquot parts, if they weren't these even numbered harmonics, that's, this would create a sine wave. If you added all these numbers together and created a signal from a signal generator, you would get a sine wave. If we added the inharmonics, such as the 12 and these different other numbers, that these things would add and subtract together to create, we could get a sawtooth sound wave. <clears throat> this is a sawtooth. I can't even draw it on here. And it's got these sharp corners to it. It's what's called a sawtooth waveform. Another waveform that engineers know a lot about with computers nowadays is a square wave. This is, what, this is a digital pulses in a computer, it's all square waves. And then, of course, we got the sine wave. The sine wave is a tone that comes from a clarinet. It is composed of these very harmonic tones. When they add it together, you get a very smooth, even tone sound, like in a flute or a whistle. If we have the inharmonic tones added to it, it'll bend this thing out of shape. It will modulate these frequencies that compose this, that this is composed of, and we'll get these sharp tones. This is like from a cornet or a trumpet. A brass instrument will create um, sawtooth waves. That's why if you sound a C on a cornet and a C on a trumpet and a C on a piano, you get totally different tones. You get different sounds. But the fundamental C is the same. It is the difference in those small tones added together give you that sound of that particular instrument. They create these various waveforms. And these are just very simplistic. They can get very, very complicated and create these forms. So, in, in our new engineering that we're doing now, the new sciences, these subtler sciences, you hear a lot about transverse waveforms and longitudinal waveforms and vortexes and all these things. And you say, well, how does all this stuff relate to anything, and what are they, and, and, and you know, just what are these people talking about? A vibration, if you throw a pebble in a, in a, in a pond, you're going to see ripples going out from it. But if you look real close, you'll see a lot of things going on at the same time. It's not just ripples, but you've got to look very carefully. This is what we're talking about in precision. You've got to be precise in what's going on. Yes? Um, the idea just came into my mind. And I wonder if it's related to this. I have done electroplating, electroforming. And you have the movement, you know, of electrons through the medium that go from, uh, you know, the cathode to the anode. I never remember who is who. Anyway, if there is a jagged form at the cathode where the deposit is supposed to occur, uh, instead of a round form, you are going to have more deposit of the metal on the jagged points than on the smooth form. The same thing happens in the circulatory system at the, at the aorta or at parts of the arteries where there are jagged forms, you have cholesterol deposits. So I wonder if there is a correlation between the smoothness of a wave and how energy reacts with the smoothness of a wave and the jaggedness of a wave. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have a sense of what I'm saying? Yes, I know what you're saying. That's a very good question. Um, there's, there's a number of things that you're, you're talking about. First and foremost, you're talking about polarity, interaction of polarities versus waveform. Uh, getting back to the waveform first, question, part of the question is, there's a science developed by, I'll remember his name shortly, it's called Centix. An Australian author developed this, where he measured the waveforms of pressure when people touch one another, especially in healers. And he found that in certain waveforms of pressure, people felt good or they didn't feel good. And we get these different reactions from the different waveforms. So yes, waveform does have an effect. Like we were talking about, if you got music it's being, that was written for and played by brass instruments, like Sousa marches, you're going to react different than if you heard a bunch of flutes or clarinets playing a melody. 
So the waveforms impact us differently, and we get different physiological results or emotional results from these different waveforms. Now, the other part of your question is on this polarity business. <clears throat> we know in electrical science that electrical energy will seek out the jagged points and it will avoid hollows. It has, as near as we can figure, and I'll, I'll, par I'll parenthesize this before I get into it over my head, is the subject of polarity is extremely intricate. Extreme. Anybody who's dealt with another human being of the opposite sex knows how complicated that can get. There's <clears throat> the, the, the positive male force seeks those points. Okay? Female force is the hollow points. The hollow, the hollows. They're not points, the hollows. And as a force radiates outward, there is the opposite and equal reaction, as Newton taught us, that attracts to those points. Now, how and why that, apps, that mechanism particularly does what it does, I do not know. I am constantly thinking about how that works. It's very, very intricate. So, there, yeah, there's two things, two parts to your question. Yeah, Bob? Uh, yeah, I may be able to shed a little light on that point stuff. When you do a electrostatic plot of that sharp point, you know, you plot the field, mm, right. then the gradient is... Exp uh, much more concentrated at that point, at the sharp point. For example, when you have lightning rods, the charge leaks off a sharpened point, etc. So the sharpened points get the attractors. Okay, and that's the, the mm -hmm. simple physics. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because well, there's there's a larger gradient. There's a larger gradient potential difference. Uh, there are more li force lines coming off of that point than on the sides. More. Okay? So it's a higher gradient coming off the point than it is off the sides. Mm -hmm. So there are less lines on the sides and more lines to the point, so that's an attractor. Yeah. There's, there's considerably uh, other factors involved in that tiny little phenomena. For instance, when water evaporates, that spot gets cool, but it has to be warm for the evaporation to take place. So we get an, an emission or radiation, and then we get the contraction of the lowering of the temperature. There's, there's a very intricate thing going on here, and we need to spend a lot more time trying to figure it out. Well, this gentleman here has a question, Bob. Right in front row. Just simply a, an explanation of the square wave, uh -huh. or maybe an instrument, a compatible, or, or not compatible, a comparable instrument to a square wave producing. Um, you had brass for the trombones, and clarinet was wood. A drum is a pulse wave. A drum is a pulse wave. Percussion is a pulse type deal. Where it's uh, it's kind of like this, only it's more compact and pulled together, right? That would be a percussion. I'm thinking, I'm trying to run through my mind. The xylophone keeps coming to mind, but I'm not sure that would be that's accurate. Well, yeah, in CD players and stuff like that, you, the reproduction is square wave, and there's a couple articles on how people don't feel as harmonic with that after it has been well, produced that way. There's why subconsciously. That takes, right. There's two reasons why that takes place. Probably a whole lot more, too, I know of. <clears throat> First place in digital sampling, when they sample the music and put it on the discs, the sampling technique is the, the microphone or the sensing device will listen to the music and then stop, and listen to the music and stop, and listen to the music and stop. So that's sampling and so many times a second. Generally, it's around, I think, 30,000 times a second. Well, what happens between those samplings is lost. But because our ears only react so quickly, we, we don't really hear that, but people who are trained in music, who are very sensitive, can pick that up, and it is not correct music. So the digitally reproduced music is not analog, it's digital, and all that, those high harmonics, like we're talking here, we go up in the high harmonics, even though we aren't aware that we hear them, our body reacts yeah. to those. So if a computer samples it and leaves those out, we don't get that. See, we don't get that at all. It's not there. And the other factor is the square wave, as we're seeing, it's aliquot constructs that create it for what it is. It doesn't have all the other components. So all digital, or nearly all of it, is done with square waves. 
So there again, we've got a distortion of what the natural phenomena is. And we've got an artificial phenomenon. So computer music is artificial, period. Uh, yeah, so getting back to this tr triune waveform, <clears throat> longitudinal wave is a wave that goes out away from its source. It's going straight out away from its source. So we've got, in this particular design, the longitudinal is up and down. So it's straight out, you know, and going the backwards too, the same thing. <clears throat> but it goes out and it comes back, out and it comes back. That's one direction. The transverse or shear wave, a lot of these vibrations have different names. These are the technical scientific terms. The transverse or shear wave is 90 degrees to that. So as longitudinal goes out, the transverse is like this. It goes out on this plane. And we can say longitudinal goes up and down like I'm standing. And longitudinal is up and down, and the transverse is on this plane. So if I rotate it, it would still be on this plane. That's the transverse going out. That's the ripples on the water. Okay. The Raleigh wave, now all these things are 90 degrees to each other. So we've got one up and down, and one this way is 90 degrees to the first. The Raleigh wave is 90 degrees to those, and it spins like this. It rotates. It has a curvilinear momentum to it. And it may be a result of the first two adding together in some sort of way to create this vortexian motion. <clears throat> so we get a tornado going, or a hurricane, we have evidence of all three vibrations going on at the same time. And uh, Keeley made these motors, these negative attractive things. One of the most amazing things he ever made was what he called his musical sphere. And there are these big brass and copper spheres. He made some out of glass. I think his original first ones were made out of glass. And he would play a tune on his harmonica or whatever, and these things would start to spin. He understood this triune mechanism of the vibrations. Once the thing got to spin, it would spin faster and faster and faster until the thing would destruct itself. But he would play a, a different tone and disrupt that chord of vibrations going on inside the sphere, and it would stop. And he always liked to hand somebody one of these spheres when they came in, and he'd get it to spin, and it would go so fast these people would be terrified <laughs> holding this thing. And he would uh, eventually, he would act like he couldn't get it stopped, see, and then he would, he would eventually stop it. <clears throat> but those uh, musical spheres, I've been real curious about how and why they work. I've got three different experiments I've done that cause rotation that conventional science, to my knowledge, does not explain what's happening. And I want to understand uh, rotation. Keeley left us a chart and on what causes rotation. It's a musical chart. It's full of musical notations and whatnot. We don't yet understand that. But in these three um, experiments, one was done with a radiometer. A radiometer is just a small little, looks like a light bulb, and you put it in a light on your window sill, and the thing will spin. Looks like a little windmill. Conventional engineering has about six different definitions of why that does what it does. And I think they're all wrong, because if they were right, we'd only have one explanation. Um, and Keeley said that if you excite, if you vibrate an atomic substance with an atomic vibration, you get rotation. This was the first experiment I did to prove to myself that Keeley was not bogus and I wasn't going to waste the rest of my life working with him. And I said, okay, well, let's do this experiment. So I, I had a radiometer, and most people don't realize this, but a radiometer has argon gas in it. If you take the argon gas out, it won't rotate. <clears throat> so the argon gas, to my interpretation of Keeley's work, is an atomic substance. It's not a molecule, it's not a complex atom, it is an atom of argon. You know, in this case, a lot of them. And uh, the only source of vibration I had to me at the time was my microwave oven. So I just took this radiometer and put it in my microwave and turned it on. And I'll tell you something, if you want to be excited, you try it. <clears throat> this thing... The, the bulb itself began to flash. The brilliant white flashes like, a, like you see in, in uh, flash bulbs on cameras. This thing will flash so brilliant it's, it'll blind you. And then this thing started to spin, but it didn't just start to spin. It span so fast you couldn't, 
You couldn't see it. It just became a blur, just like that, instant. <clears throat> but you got to be careful. If you leave it in there more than three or four seconds, the uh, the needle that suspends the little windmill turns red hot, white hot, and it melts right through the little glass thing. So, in five seconds, it costs you ten bucks. That's about what those things cost. <laughs> so you just want to run it three or four seconds and see this thing. It is absolutely incredible. And that taught me two things. One is Conventional engineering knows nothing about what causes those things to do what they do. They don't know anything about it. And two, Keeley knew. Unless it was just a bunch of circumstances that happily resulted in all this motion and activity going on in this microwave. Another experiment I had, and I brought it with me. It's over here on the table, and I'll show it to anybody who wants to see it. We took a armature from an electric motor and we stripped all the copper wire off of it. There's no magnets on it. We put two bearings on the shaft. And if you attach a DC current to either side of this armature and give it a little nudge, this thing will start to spin. And it will accelerate until it flies apart. But we, it gets too hot for that. We disconnect it in four or five seconds. These things are very fast. It's incredible. And I took it to the conference in Denver a few months ago where all these electrical engineers, all the foremost people in the world, and not one of them could tell me how it did what it did. We since found out that DC current is not really DC current. It has is an oscillating current or an alternating current that has a frequency beyond the gamma range. So at all intents and purposes, it is a DC current. But in actuality, here again, we get in our precision, it is an alternating current. And it has to be an alternating current or that thing wouldn't spin. I know that much about it. We have to have positive and negative forces going on, or we don't get the Raleigh wave, the Lamb wave going around in circles. Another question here? Um, I have either read or seen something on, in the 40s where they had two counter rotating fields, and they, I don't know how they did this. They made a spacecraft, somebody did this, and it would disappear, and he could fly around, be conscious inside, and see but he would not be able to be seen outside. And they did this in New Mexico, I believe, and went 30, 40 miles back and forth in a few seconds. So some of this, when it gets going that fast, just becomes unable for us to see, I think, is mm -hmm. part of it, Without this, if, it, if the material doesn't destroy itself. Yeah. So I don't, I, don't, I don't know about the, the counter field, how they did that. They were going in different directions. So that DC would be negative and positive in that case. All right. That's a very good question. I've, I've never heard of that particular instance either, but <clears throat> it brings up another aspect of this physics. Um, if we could maintain the algorithm uh, Henry was talking about <clears throat> how the fractal resemblance of this molecule exists. If we could maintain that mathematical algorithm, maintain its integrity, and we could s increase the velocity of spin on this molecule, it would shrink. It would pop to the next size smaller instantly. That's a quantum leap of quantum physics, by the way. When the energy increases or decreases, we get this release of or condensation of energy. <clears throat> if we could do that, this thing would shrink into a subatomic particle level, maintaining its integrity, and guess what? You would be invisible. Now, if you could slow it all down all at the same time, it's like a computer program. If you slow it down all the time, all of a sudden it would pop back into visibility. Pop. Invisible. Nonsensible. Well, that's we, we, how you can explain a teleportation of objects. Right. Because in a teleportation of objects, the visible object has to shrink to the point that it becomes invisible, and then obviously it decelerates and becomes visible again. Pretty much the same, yeah. Um, it's kind of like a Star Trek thing where they uh, transport people. I don't think it's feasible that we could ever. Dis disassociate an individual and then reassociate maybe, you know, who knows what's going to happen next year, but <clears throat> uh, if we could maintain that mathematical integrity of it, 
it would be a fairly simplistic thing, you know, much simpler. That, by the way, that kind of idea may explain some of this UFO type stuff we've been hearing about. You know, if they could maintain that integrity and shrink to that energy level, all of a sudden velocity of propagation becomes infinite. They could cruise the universe in minutes. Yeah, but teleportation have been observed all the time. I mean, I have observed them, I experienced them myself. So uh -huh. this is not just mm -hmm. theory. This is, you know, experiential right. reality. Teleportation is a little bit different in that the gravitic component. Here we get back to another whole aspect of the science. Keeley maintained that gravity, magnetism, and electricity were intimately intertwined with each other. Just as I showed the, the picture of the, of the uh, vibration, these charts, I gotta, I gotta make a statement here. These charts, I keep using the same chart over and over and over again, and I keep using, as I talk about one, I talk about the other. And, and this is a holistic science. It's not just take this one thing and this is what it's all about. It takes a certain amount of time and energy to study all these different little things, and then all of a sudden you get the picture. And it is real simple, and you just got to keep going over it and going over it and going over it. This gets back to, we're going to start with the sun to explain this thing about electricity, magnetism, <coughs> and gravity. <clears throat> the sun heats the earth, they tell us, and the sun lights the earth, they tell us. And, uh, and then they say, well, you know, if you want to, if you want to maintain a refrigerated area, you need vacuum as the best insulator against heat. And then they say there's 93 million miles of vacuum between the sun and us. And I say, well, something's not right here. If the heat can go, come from the sun to the earth through all that vacuum. And there really is no physics to explain that. One guy will label it, and he'll say, well, it's radiation that heats the earth. Well, a label doesn't explain anything. All it does is tags it. It's like saying an apple falls to the ground because of gravity. That doesn't explain what's happening. And radiation doesn't explain what's happening in this particular case. Keeley had an explanation for this. You know, if there was heat coming from the sun and light coming from the sun as heat and light, interplanetary space would be full of light and it would be hot. And it isn't. It's cold and it's dark. Um, before we go into that, we're going to have to change taste. Could we take about a five-minute break? Fine. Fine. <clears throat> five-minute break.